This is called Analogy, Divine Naming, and a Complex Semantics for the Simple God. St. Thomas Aquinas' reflections on divine names are informed in part by Pseudo-Dionysius' treatise by that title. Commenting on that work, Aquinas notes that compared with other works by Dionysius, which treat divine truths which exceed reason and find no adequate likeness in creatures, or where the likeness is not truly in God but is merely transferred from creatures to God, On Divine Names treats characteristics in God which are knowable because creatures themselves derive likenesses of these characteristics from God. Thus, in Aquinas' account, Pseudo-Dionysius in the Divine Names treats what can be understood of the proper attributes of the one God knowable by reason. Though clearly drawing inspiration from faith, we could anachronistically say that Dionysius' treatise functions very much as an exercise in natural theology. In particular, it reflects on how our concepts and language can be extended to God precisely because our concepts and language are derived from likenesses that emanate from and participate in their preeminent, perfect source. Words express, even if in a very exceptional way, what we know about divine reality and for Pseudo-Dionysius, reflecting on these words and the ways that they express divine realities is not just a matter of theological language, but of theological epistemology and metaphysics. The divine names are an occasion to contemplate divinity and its attributes. Although deeply informed by this work, when Aquinas writes his own theological treatises, the topic of divine names becomes more circumscribed. In the Summa Theologiae, question 13 of the Prima Pars addresses divine naming. But before then, quite a bit of ground has been covered in saying things about God and about our knowledge of God in questions 2 through 12. And you could find a comparable structure in the Summa Contra Gentiles. We could say that Aquinas is content to exercise divine naming before making it an object of reflection in its own right, But it is clear that for Aquinas, the topic of divine naming is a more circumscribed part of theology. Rather than essentially covering the investigations of natural theology, it is about how, as Lawrence Dewan has described, certain words as applied to God have a distinctive meaning and a distinctive way of meaning what they mean. As in Dionysius, for Aquinas, the names in question are not proper names, but any true predicates of God. At issue are words like good, just, wise, and powerful, and even including the very word God, which is not really a proper name for Aquinas, but functions more like a common term, although a very unique one. The presumption is that these words can be truly predicated of God. But given God's otherness from the creaturely context in which such words are learned, how do these words function when they are predicated of God? So rather than encompassing natural theology as a whole, Aquinas' own doctrine of divine names is what we might call a theological semantics. Aquinas' doctrine of analogy is sometimes taken to be almost coincident with the topic of divine names, or if not that, at least the most important element in understanding Aquinas' answer to the question of divine naming. And here you could start decoding the Venn diagrams at the top of the handout. So the color coding corresponds to the colors in the title. Analogy is the reddish uh, with a little bit of yellow, and uh, divine naming is blue with a little bit of green hidden in there. Um, So sometimes people think that the red and the blue are just the same thing, like analogy is a divine naming issue and divine naming is an analogy issue. That's so overly simplistic you won't actually find that anywhere in the literature, but Sometimes people, when they're introduced to it, they get that fir- that wrong first impression, or they get the idea that um, divine naming is like a, a big thing in the center of the idea. Maybe analogy applies to a few other things, but divine naming is the is the thing in the center of it, or that um, analogy only applies in the case of divine naming. So you get analogy as the red circle inside of the blue. Okay, you can you can. Keep decoding with me as, as I continue to read. 
So analogy occupies the largest and central part in Gregory Rocca's book about Aquinas's theological language, for instance, and in the assigned reading that you had, uh, and I know you've all done your assigned reading because you're good students, Rudy Tevelde expresses a common view in his chapter on divine names. Um, he says, the question of divine names is for Aquinas first and foremost a question of how names can be common to God and creatures. And whenever he treats this question, his answer is that names are said analogously. Tevelde does not say, to his credit, but the reader could easily get the impression from what he does say, or from many other treatments of Aquinas, that analogy is the answer to the question of divine naming. And so I offer here a corrective to this impression. It is a mistake to treat analogy as the whole of, or even the most important part of, Aquinas' approach to divine naming. And it is a mistake to treat divine naming as a single problem and not a set of related questions. These mistakes involve misunderstandings about analogy in general, about the topic of divine naming, and about the role of analogy in addressing the topic of divine names. In fact, Aquinas has much to say about divine naming apart from and without referring to analogy. Um, in the commentary on Dionysius' divine names, the word analogia doesn't appear, and, and its cognates don't appear. By clarifying Aquinas' understanding of analogy, I want to show its very specific and limited application in Aquinas' treatment of theological language, and I therefore hope to clarify other linguistic or semantic insights of Aquinas, often neglected or conflated with analogy, that play a more central role in Aquinas' doctrine of divine names. So I will proceed thus. First, I will try to clarify what analogy means for Aquinas. And here I will explain what is, I think, well established, but rarely expressed just this way, that Aquinas actually has two concepts of analogy. And by this, I do not mean that he has two types or classes or modes of analogy or two stages in his thought about analogy. All those are common theories, but that's not what I'm talking about. But that he has two logically distinct, separate concepts of analogy altogether. Aquinas learned both of these concepts from Aristotle, and they deserve to be treated separately, even though they can be and sometimes are related. So the final, most complicated Venn diagram has a red circle and a yellow circle. Those are the two concepts of analogy. They do overlap. They overlap with the blue divine naming, and then we'll get to the green circle by the end of the paper. That's the first part. Second, I will show that both concepts of analogy are relevant to Aquinas' treatment of divine naming. At the same time, both are relevant to other areas of Aquinas' thought which have nothing to do with divine naming. And finally, I will argue that to appreciate Aquinas' treatment of divine names, we have to distinguish different senses of the question, how can names be predicated of God? And see that to answer these questions, Aquinas appeals to other semantic concepts and distinctions, quite apart from either of the two notions of analogy. Only by attending to these can we understand how what is special about God is reflected in what is special about the way human language functions when applied to God, and how general assumptions about how language functions can determine what sort of divinity we are even capable of conceiving. So two concepts of analogy. And here the, um, the chart on the, the bottom part of that page is um, helpful, I hope. It's commonly said that Aquinas did not have a developed doctrine of analogy, certainly no systematic treatment. The mentions of analogy in Aquinas are always occasional. He invokes it to solve particular problems. And because of this, commentators hoping to formulate the Thomistic doctrine have had plenty to argue about. Here are a few questions they ask. Is there a theory that could be explicitly stated, or did Aquinas have principled reasons for not developing a systematic theory of analogy? Did his views on analogy develop? over his career? Is analogy primarily a metaphysical or a logical teaching for Aquinas? Is there a consistent or at least a most mature account of different modes or types of analogy in Aquinas? Which later commentator best interprets and systematizes Aquinas? If you venture into the vast literature on Aquinas on analogy, these are the questions that dominate. Even commentators striving to return to a strict exegesis of Aquinas' texts find themselves lost in the thickets of these later interpretive questions. We can avoid, or at least reframe, many of these questions by observing that there are, in fact, two very different concepts of analogy in Aquinas. One of them, 
the more commonly invoked and recognized, conceives of analogy as a kind of relationship between different applications of a word. In this case, analogy is a linguistic phenomenon located between two other linguistic phenomena, univocation and equivocation. These may be familiar to you, and if they're not, it's easy to learn. In univocation, a term signifies the same content across multiple uses. The dog, the fish, and the bird can each be called an animal in exactly the same sense. In equivocation, a term signifies very different content in different uses. What I hit the baseball with is not a bat in the same sense that the nocturnal flying mammal is a bat. In between is analogical predication, where there is some degree of difference, but also some degree of sameness. To take the most common example in the Aristotelian tradition, the meaning of healthy as predicated of food is related to, but clearly not exactly the same as, the meaning of healthy as predicated of a urine sample. And there would be consequences if you thought that was univocal. I will call this widely recognized concept of analogy, describing a relationship between linguistic functions, associated meaning. So that's the red column, associated meaning. There's another sense of analogy in Aquinas, not a category of linguistic relation, but a category of likeness, similitude, or unity. In this context, it is compared not with univocation or equivocation, but with other metaphysical categories of likeness or unity, specific and generic likeness. As this context implies, and other contexts make clear, this non-generic or supergeneric likeness does not involve the sharing of a common form or characteristic, as specific or generic likenesses do, but instead it must be conceived in terms of a relation of relations. We say that A is non-generically like X if A is to B as X is to Y. Um, this, this kind of thinking used to be more common. There used to be a part of the SATs that was um, uh, analogies. Uh, a, a lot of Plato's Republic is basically working with analogies. The sun allegory is an analogy. The, the city is supposed to be an analogy for the soul, right? So you're not, you're not claiming that there's an identity or a, 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 a common um, univocal adherence of a form, right? But you're claiming that there is a relationship in this one domain that that somehow reproduces or represents a, a uh, relationship in another domain. Due to this four-term structure, I call this sense of analogy a metaphysical category of unity or likeness that does not imply sharing a common quality or form, proportional likeness. So that's the yellow column. On the face of it, associated meaning and proportional likeness are not the same content, concept. One is linguistic, one is metaphysical. It is possible to imagine how they can be connected, to be sure. Generic likeness implies that a genus term could be used, and genus terms are univocal, so there's, there's a possibility of connecting them. And proportional likeness implies that, at least under the concept of proportional likeness, the common term is not strictly univocal, but a case of associated meaning linguistically analogical, so the most common example of that in the Aristotelian tradition is that the intellectual vision implies this form four-term structure that the, the mind is related to its object somehow like the eye is related to its object, but they're very different kinds of powers um, and their objects are very different. On the other hand, not every case where things are in fact related by proportional likeness requires there to be a common term predicated of each. One can notice a similarity of relationship between two things that don't share a common name. And that's why there's always room for poetic insight to coin a new metaphor, for instance. Moreover, proportional likeness is not the only kind of relationship that must hold between two things that receive an analogical predication. Nobody in the tradition says that the food and the urine sample are both healthy because they have a proportional likeness to each other or to the health of the animal. They are called healthy because they have a relation other than proportionality to the health of an animal, respectively as cause and as sign. So I think this much would be obvious from reflection on the concepts themselves, but it's even more clear when we look at their articulation by Aquinas' source for these ideas, namely Aristotle. For Aristotle, the Greek term analogia was used to describe what I am calling here proportional likeness the non-generic similarity conceived on the four-term schema. Aristotle and others extended this from a mathematical context. Aristotle also had a notion of associated meaning, but he never referred to this as analogia. Rather, it was equivocation pros hen, toward one, or with reference to one. 
The very few occasions on which Aquinas brings the two concepts together only serves to emphasize that they are distinct. It is thanks to Neoplatonic commentary on Aristotle, to Boethius's handling of translation challenges from Greek to Latin, and to the Arabic commentary tradition, that these notions came to be more closely related, so that by the time of Aquinas, the term analogia had migrated from proportional likeness in Greek to cover also, and even for some authors primarily, associated meaning in Latin. Aquinas inherited both concepts of analogy, and depending on context, he uses the term analogia for both of them. Associated meaning, analogy as a mean between univocation and equivocation, is the sense of the word analogy at work in Article 5 uh, of the question on divine naming, where analogy is introduced as a way of ensuring that words as said of God have something in common with how they are said of creatures, but they are not said univocally. But the very first sense of analogy to appear in the Summa Theologiae is the other concept, proportional likeness. In question 4, article 3, and I think I have this on the other handout with some texts on it, uh, addressing whether creatures can be like God, Aquinas distinguishes different senses of likeness and argues that not every kind of likeness implies membership in a common genus. Both in the body of the response and in the reply to the third objection, Aquinas invokes analogy as an alternative to specific or generic likeness, a likeness according to analogy. It's clearly the proportionality concept that's at work there. Uh, in general, so you've, you've deciphered this by now. Right? What I've done here is put a number of texts, some of them theological, so they're indicated in blue, but a lot of them having nothing to do with theology or not, not primarily theological texts, and indicated whether in the given passage one or the other or sometimes both concepts of analogy are at work and then what specific ways um, Aquinas might be signaling that by a certain description or terminology um, to, to indicate what, what concept is it work? It's undeniable that Aquinas recognized both concepts of analogy throughout his career. Regarding proportional likeness, there are several texts that explicitly describe analogy as a kind of unity or likeness characterized in terms of the four-term schema. These texts span Aquinas' works, and they include not only theological, but also philosophical commentaries and treatises. Commentators who want to focus on analogy as associated meaning still cannot ignore the concept of proportional likeness, even if they find reason to marginalize it. So in in the written paper, there's a footnote that um, indicates that Klubertans, who did a a mostly exhaustive study of of Aquinas' use of analogy, most of the uses of proportionality he puts in a chapter on problem areas under a subheading of irrelevant cases, right? He's just like, I can't handle that. It doesn't fit my schema. So they're all there. He found them, but then he just had to sort of put them to the side. In many passages that describe proportional likeness, Aquinas uses the word analogy as the name for this relationship. Very often, Aquinas will call it analogy or proportion. He'll use the alternative. And sometimes he doesn't use the word analogy at all and only calls the relationship proportion. To make matters more confusing, in Aquinas, sometimes proportion is also the name for any relation at all, not this four-term schema, in which case when Aquinas wants to refer to the proportional likeness of the four-term schema, he will call it proportionality, a terminological solution he inherited from Boethius. Boethius coined that word in Latin because it was already too confusing how to translate analogia from Greek into Latin. In Aquinas's, Aquinas' language for naming this relationship is inconsistent then, but the relationship itself is consistently recognized across a variety of works, across Aquinas' career, and while it does have theological applications, it also appears in non-theological contexts. For instance, in his analysis of cognition, how we learn about prime matter and other cases. So that's what you get by looking at this sort of scattering of check marks in the proportionality column. Um, Sorry, the yellow side. There are also certain concepts that Aquinas takes to be implied by the non-generic proportionality relation. So this relation is often associated with particular words, sometimes the word likeness itself, along with image, imitation, representation, and participation. For all of these, Aquinas seems to recognize that the commonality they suggest is not generic or specific, implying a common form received in the same way in different individuals. 
but proportional, implying the four-term schema or a relation of proportions between different domains, such as the way the parts of a map are like the terrain they map, not because of a common form, but because the relationship of parts of the map represent, because they are proportional to, relationships in the mapped terrain. Aquinas makes this explicit, for instance, in commenting on the word image in a passage from the sentences commentary. So I think this is, uh, this is also on the handout um, at the bottom of the, the first side of the text. In response, I'm quoting, it must be said that the ratio of an image consists in imitation, whence its name is taken, for imago is said like imitago. But in the ratio of imitation, there are two things to be considered, namely that in which there is imitation and that which is imitated. Now that in respect of which there is imitation is some quality or form signified by the mode of a quality, whence the ratio of image is similitude. But this isn't enough. But it must be that there is some adequation in that quality, either according to quality or according to proportion. That is, as it is clear that in a small image, there is an equal proportion of parts to each other as in the large thing of which it is an image, and therefore adequation is posited in its definition. So I take that passage to be basically saying, if you get the notion of this thing being an image of that thing, then you have to be thinking in terms of the four-term schema. There's, there's relationships going on over here, and somehow those are reproduced by like relationships going on over here. But it's not sameness of form, it's proportionality of relations. Although he doesn't call it analogy in this passage, this is the proportionality relationship that is called analogy in question 4, article 3 of the first part of the Summa. Um, I mentioned that earlier. The question there is whether any creature can be like God, and here, instead of image, Aquinas talks about an effect as participating in a likeness of the cause irreducible to a generic likeness. So here I'm quoting Aquinas again. If there is an agent not contained in any genus, its effects will still more distantly reproduce the form of the agent, not, that is, so as to participate in the likeness of the agent's form according to the same specific or generic formality, but only according to some sort of analogy. That's the proportionality use of analogy, not the linguistic use. In the replies to objections, Aquinas describes this as a kind of imitation. So there's that word again in the uh, response to the second objection. He um, describes it also as participation in the reply to the third objection. And the function of an image which proportionately represents what is imaged is reprised here by the example of a statue in the reply to the fourth objection because the statue is proportional, proportionally, proportionally like that thing of which it is a statue. So there's um, a case for the sort of consistent prominence and importance of proportionality in Aquinas. Turning to associated meaning, most commentators have focused on how Aquinas uses analogy as associated meaning, that is the linguistic phenomenon that's a mean between univocation and equivocation a word with meanings partly the same and partly different, with a primary meaning to which secondary meanings are somehow related. It is uncontroversial to find this throughout Aquinas' career. Certainly in different contexts, he describes different ways of characterizing this kind of analogy, different ways of distinguishing subclasses or modes of this kind of analogy, and this is what commentators typically focus on and argue about. Um, but it is undeniable that analogy is a, as associated meaning is a consistently is a consistent concept throughout Aquinas' writings. As with proportionality, it appears in crucial theological contexts, but in plenty of non-theological contexts as well. Aquinas describes it as involving signification that is partly the same and partly different, where the partly the same is understood in terms of the different meanings having an order of priority, per prius et posterioris is the Latin phrase that's repeated, such that secondary significations make reference to a primary signification, or, as he sometimes puts it, some significations are qualified or modified, secundum quid. We decided last night that you could translate that as it's, com com it's complicated. Um, <laughs> dependent on an unqualified or absolute simpliciter signification. The fact that the two concepts are distinct is only reinforced by those few occasions where Aquinas uses both together. So you see on this chart, usually there's check marks only on one side or the other, but I've got a few texts near the bottom with check marks in both, on both sides. There is a much discussed text from De Veritate 2.11 where proportional likeness is invoked to characterize a particular type of associated meaning. 
But let us take a much earlier and non-theological work on the principles of nature, and we can find the same thing. In the last chapter, Aquinas first introduces analogy as a category of likeness, and I, and I put most of chapter 6 on this handout. There's, there's a little bit that I cut out to fit it all. Um, and the color coding here, you figured this out by now, right, is my attempt to signal. It, it might not be quite as pure as this would lead you to believe, but I think, there, I think it's legitimate for me to signal this way, which is the dominant concept at work. And you see him switching back and forth here, so I'm going to describe it but not read it. In the last chapter, Aquinas first introduces analogy as a category of likeness or unity beyond specific and generic unity, specifically describing it in terms of the four-term schema. So that's proportional likeness. As part of this, then, he also discusses its implications for predication, shifting to the notion of analogy as a linguistic relationship, a mean between univocation and equivocation. So there's associated meaning. But then he elaborates on analogy as associated meaning to describe the different ways being is predicated of substance and accidents. And then at the very end, he returns to the other concept of analogy, proportionality, in order to describe how not only is being linguistically analogical, but principle and nature are also linguistically analogical. And he explains this using the metaphysical relationship of proportional likeness, even explicitly employing the four-term schema. So I'll just quote this part of it. Matter, form, and privation of substance and quantity differ generically, but they agree according to proportion only, insofar as the matter of substance is to substance in the nature of matter as the matter of quantity is to quantity. So anytime you see this is to that as this is to that, you're, you're dealing with the four-term schema. Still, this is quoting Aquinas, continuing, just as substance is the cause of the others, so the principles of substance are the principles of all the others. So it's useful to compare on the principles of nature, which uses the word analogy for each of the two analogy concepts, with another early work, De Ante et Ascentia. Here again, Aquinas employs both concepts, which we might expect given that this is a more explicitly metaphysical and theological context. Regarding associated meaning, Aquinas explores different senses of being, describing the linguistic relationship of a term being said in a primary or absolute way of one thing and in a secondary or qualified sense of something else. He twice describes being and essence as said primarily of substance and secondarily or secundum quid of accidents. And he once describes a word predicated per prius of one and per posterioris of the other. Regarding proportional likeness, the logic of Dante de Sentia's main argument implies that we can learn about separate created substances and even about God from composite substances by analogical reasoning that is, he depends on human inquiry following the four-term schema of the proportionality relationship to reason from the nature of composite beings to the nature of simple beings, right? We start with matter and form, we go to act and potency, we go to um, being and essence as having an act and potency type relationship. Notably, however, in this work, Aquinas never uses the term analogy in either the linguistic or the proportionality sense. So to recap, there are two concepts of analogy, a linguistic one, associated meaning, and a metaphysical one, proportionality. And Aquinas employed both of these concepts. He was aware that the two concepts could be related, but, he did, but they did not have to be related. He could employ either concept with or without using the word analogy, and both senses of analogy had metaphysical and theological applications, but not only such applications. They are relevant to other issues than the signification of being or of divine attributes. All of this, I think, is important for interpreting the relationship between analogy and divine naming. So that's where we'll turn now. To show the important but very limited applicability of both analogy concepts to the topic of divine naming, I will focus on question 13 of Summa Theologiae Prima Pars. And rather than quote it, which would be way too long, I've given a summary of it. Uh, with some observations on this table on the back, and the color coding continues there. By this point, by question 13, much of a god's uniqueness has been established, with plenty of reasons to think that it should be hard to speak meaningfully about him at all. Immediately after the existence of God, in question 2, Aquinas has covered divine simplicity, question 3, with no distinction of matter and form in articles 1 and 2, no distinction of nature and supposit in article 3, of being and essence, of substance and accident, 
of particular relevance is that there is not even composition of genus and difference. God cannot be defined and is not contained in a genus. That's in Article 5 of Question 3. After, and logically following divine simplicity, we have covered divine perfection, goodness, infinity, immanence, immutability, eternity, and unity in questions 4 through 11, and we heard about a lot of this in, in some of the talks yesterday. Together with question 12, on our manner of knowing God, the question on naming God helps to mark the turn from the theological via remotionis to the via affirmationis. Now, that's actually a little bit controversial and not a lot, a lot rides on that for me, but that's a common way of describing why he puts divine naming here. The unique character of God, lacking so many features of created being, together with our real but severely limited ability to know him, raises the question of how we can speak meaningfully and truthfully about God, which turns out to be a number of related but separately articulated problems. So, and I try, in more or less my own words, to, to formulate what is the problem going on in each, in each case in the leftmost column um, of, of the chart on the back. Question 13 has 12 articles, and it's as such is one of the longest questions in the Summa's first part. Of these 12, analogy is invoked by name in only a very few. It's not mentioned in the answers to such questions as whether we can name God, Article 1, whether we can predicate words substantially, Article 2, or literally, Article 3, or whether terms said of God are synonymous, Article 4. Analogy as associated meaning only seems specifically invoked to answer the question of whether names are predicated of God univocally, which we don't get to until Article 5. Having introduced analogy to solve that problem, Aquinas also finds it useful to clarify the sense of priority in the order of naming in Article 6. But after that, analogy as associated meaning seems to play no role at all in addressing whether relations to creatures are predicated temporally of God, Article 7, how the very word God functions as a special predicate, Articles 8 and 9, and in Article 10, which explicitly asks about different ways God, the term God, can signify, it does invoke, invoke analogy, but it doesn't help address the subsequent question about God's most proper name in Article 11. Notably, Aquinas does not invoke analogy when answering the culminating article of question 13, which asks whether we can form affirmative propositions about God, article 12. So in question 13, all the explicit references to analogy, that's in articles 5, 6, and 10, are to analogy as associated meaning, the linguistic phenomenon. Primarily, analogy here responds to a question about what kind of community, univocal or otherwise, words can have when predicated of creatures in God. So in the context of divine naming, the invocation of analogy as associated meaning is actually quite limited in its function. Analogy is not a general key to understanding how words can be truly applied to God, nor even to how words can be extended to God from creatures. That words can signify the divine substance, that they signify literally and not metaphorically, that we can make true affirmations, that different words signifying the same divine nature are not therefore synonymous, all of this is explained without reference to the linguistic notion of analogy. That there are words common to God and creatures and how they are common turns out to be articulated with reference to a number of different semantic observations unrelated to analogy, and that's what the green color coding is for. Analogy as associated meaning addresses only the specific question of the kind of commonality exhibited. It is not the commonality of unification, but the commonality of associated meaning where a term has significations partly the same and partly different, which we all know by now applies to many other cases besides divine naming. So it's pretty common in language that, that, that there be associated meaning like that. Despite the limited work done by analogy in this question, Article 5 has received a disproportionate amount of attention, especially because of a distinction in how analogous names are used, sometimes as many having relation to one, and other times as one having relation to another. Many commentators have treated many to one and one to another as distinctions of modes of analogy with deep linguistic and metaphysical implications. I pick on some bigwigs in the footnotes here, like Whipple and Father Thomas Joseph White and some others. But the examples Aquinas uses and his use of the same distinction elsewhere makes clear that what is at stake is no more than whether the primary analogate, that thing to which all the secondary meanings of the terms as applied to secondary analogates is ordered, is included among the given set of things analogically named, 
So, and he, these are his examples. Healthy set of both medicine and urine is a many-to-one application, since the primary sense of healthy, by which it's predicated of an animal, is not included in the multiple items being considered, medicine and urine. But the same word, healthy, said of medicine and animal, on the other hand, is a one-to-another application of analogy because the one primary meaning is one of the two, the health of the animal, to which the other, the health of the medicine, refers. Now, if you think, like, Aquinas is trying to draw some deep metaphysical implications about God's causality from the example of urine and medicine and and the health of the animal, I, 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 I don't see it in that text. All Aquinas wants to say with this distinction is that the primary or focal meaning in divine naming is God, not some third thing signified over and above God and creatures. In fact, this consideration of the primary analogate leads to the clarification in Article 6 that in the case of divine names, we have to distinguish between what is primary in the order of learning and what is primary in the metaphysical order. Even this distinction is formulated in terms of semantic categories. Creatures are primary as that from which the analogical term is first imposed to signify. We learn about wisdom by meeting a a, a creature that seems to have the quality of wisdom. While God is is primary as having been uh, as having or being primarily what the name signifies. So once we learn more about the nature of wisdom, we realize that its true origin is in the original um, perfect wisdom of God. The only other explicit mention of analogy in question 13 is in article 10. The puzzle there is about how the word God applies to things like idols or to allegedly multiple gods that are not God. The objections describe in different ways the same general concern. How can one who knows the one true God be said to be contradicted by someone who calls, say, an idol God? Right? That would seem to be a case of um, equivocation. He's using God in a different sense. And so, like, is there even a, a contradiction? Um, or it would seem to require, if there is, there is a contradiction, that there be a univocal notion of God that's applying in both cases. But then um, we, we don't want to say that it means exactly the same thing. Here Aquinas responds that the related meanings in analogy can be sufficiently similar with the signification of one included in the signification of the other to serve as a foundation for contradiction and valid reasoning. Aquinas, like Aristotle, is convinced that analogy is, at least in some cases, sufficiently unified to preserve reasoning. How this is possible, Aquinas, like Aristotle, does not further analyze, and so it becomes a contested subject of much later commentary, especially after Scotus's insistence that valid reasoning requires univocity. So Scotus raises a question about this, but Aquinas doesn't, it, it isn't pressed by it, and so we don't really know what, how functionally it's, it's unified enough, but we know that he thinks it is. The answer may have something to do with the other analogy concept that Aquinas learned from Aristotle. No explicit analogy reference in question 13 invokes the metaphysical relationship of proportional likeness, but Aquinas does not and could not deny that such a relationship exists between creatures and God. Such a relationship has been previously established, and it is part of what gives rise to the question of how it is possible for language to apply to God in the first place. Analogy as the metaphysical relationship of proportional likeness certainly plays a role in question 13. The notion of proportional likeness is crucial in Article 2, for instance, when Aquinas says that every creature imperfectly represents God. That is, the substance of God is genuinely represented in creatures, but in a manner that falls short. Here and in Article 13, the relationship of representation and the finite way in which a creature manifests what is preeminently in God suggests a likeness relation that isn't the sharing of a common property, but a relation of proportions according to the four-term schema. While Aquinas doesn't use the word analogy in this context to describe the relationship of proportional likeness, it is implied by his use of the words representation and similitude. And since the emphasis here is on language, it presumes that what, it, what came earlier about our cognition operating through likeness, image, or representation in question 12, and it's summarized in terms of the so-called semantic triangle in Aquinas' response to Article 1. He says words are signs of understandings, and understandings are likenesses of things. So there's a kind of representation or likeness in the mind of, of what the thing is. There is not a proportional relationship between the expressed, that is the written or spoken word, and its object, since that's just an arbitrary relationship of conventional language. But there is a proportional relationship between the cognitive act, 
which mediates the signification of words, loosely the concept, or what later commentators will call the formal concept, and that which the word signifies, the thing signified, or what later commentators will call the objective concept. Apart from analogy as a linguistic phenomenon, then, much of what Aquinas tries to say about how language applies to God depends on this understanding of the relationship between language, mind, and reality, and in particular the idea that the human concept is a formal representation of the thing of which it is a concept, and that human truth involves a composition of formal representations in the mind that reflects a genuine proportionate composition in things. So this leads to the third part, <clears throat> divine naming in realist semantics. And we get to the green. In discussion of analogy in question 13, we, we have been forced to consider some other semantic terminology beyond analogy as a mean between univocation and equivocation. It's instructive to survey the extent of logical terminology in the question on divine names, and this is what that right-hand column is meant to show. Consider the various categories and distinctions of semantic functions Aquinas employs in addressing divine naming. The semantic triangle I've already mentioned and the distinction between abstract and concrete terms in Article 1, the notion of imposition in Articles 2 and 6 and 8, the distinction between the mode of signification and what is signified in Article 3, the distinction between the thing signified and its ratio in Article 4 and invoked again in 5 and 6, the different ways of signifying a relation in Article 7. That's effectively a, an application of the distinction between extrinsic and intrinsic denomination. The distinction between nature and supposit in Articles 9 and 12. The notion of consignification in Article 11. And finally, the account of truth in predication in Article 12. A more complete analysis of question 13 would further explicate each of these semantic notions in detail. For my purposes, it is enough to point out that taken together, this represents the terminology of a particular conceptual framework, that of realist semantics. In fact, one could almost reconstruct the realist semantic framework from the 12 articles in the question on divine names. Here I will only sum summarize realist semantics as it is captured in its account of predication as suggested in Article 12. According to this inherence theory of predication, in an affirmative proposition such as Socrates is a man, the predicate term man signifies a form, humanity, and the predication is true if and only if that form, humanity, actually inheres in the thing designated by the subject term, namely Socrates. So the proposition Socrates is a man is true if and only if the person Socrates is being actualized by the form of humanity signified by the term man, and the mind thinking the truth of this proposition does so by mentally combining or uniting the form of humanity with Socrates. That's very rough, and we could make all kinds of qualifications, but I just want to sketch out the, the general picture here. By the same token, to affirm the truth of the proposition Socrates is an animal, we must understand that animality, signified by the term animality, is actual in Socrates. We know that animality and humanity are logically different. After all, something can be an animal without being a man. And so they each have their own ratio or definition. But on the other hand, in Socrates... The reality that is his humanity, Socrates' substantial form, which actualizes Socrates as the kind of substance he is, is just that by virtue of which Socrates is an animal. There doesn't need to be an additional substantial form other than Socrates' humanity, which causes Socrates to be an animal. That's just the Thomistic doctrine of the unicity of substantial form. But other actualities of Socrates are not identical with his substantial form. For instance, if Socrates is wise, it is because he has the accident of wisdom, an accidental actuality which is signified by the term wise or the term wisdom in the true proposition Socrates is wise. And assuming Socrates is also just, his wisdom is distinct from another accidental reality, justice, signified by the term just in the true proposition Socrates is just. So you see how once you have this account, you just keep applying it like this. The predicate signifies a form which inheres in the subject. This account of the truth of proposition seems to work well for the world of finite composite objects. It reflects a composition of intellectual cognitions, which in turn reflects a composition of the things themselves, unities constituted by substantial forms actualizing matter, accidents inhering in substances, different grammatical modes reflecting different ways of signifying these forms. Right, So that form humanity is signified 
in itself by the word humanity, or it's signified as something that is in another, or, or, or can be predicated as something else by the term man. So that's that's the the different function of the abstract and concrete forms, or abstract and concrete uh, grammatical um, uh, terms. The special questions of divine names arise because we want to extend this account of how language works, that is, compositionally, in terms of forms and hearing and things, in order to explain how it is possible to speak of a simple substance. In God, as conceived by Aquinas, there is no composition of matter and form, of accident and substance, of nature and its subject, not even a composition of being and essence. There's not even a composition of different perfections or divine attributes, since these are all the same in God. God does not have a nature because he is a nature, and his nature is subsisting essay. Still, the nature that is God can be named, even though it is so remote from our understanding and known only through its effects, because a word which gets its signification from creatures can still signify something that is in God, insofar as the creature itself is a representation of God. That's Articles 1 and 2. Our words fall short of God in their mode of signification, as our words are always either abstract or concrete, and God somehow transcends that distinction. Uh, But but our words don't fall short of God in what they signify. That's Article 3. The divine attributes are different in our understanding, our understanding, and so they have different rationes and they're not synonymous, despite being verified by the same one simple actuality of God. God, although grammatically a common name, signifies that in which there is no distinction between nature and supposit, and so it is incommunicable, so it kind of functions like a proper name, it only belongs to one thing, and the abstract form, divinity, is as appropriate a name for God as the concrete form, God. That's Article 9. And since in God, also the supposit and... and, the supposit slash nature, since there's no distinction in God, is identical with its being, the most proper name for God is one which suggests his ongoing activity of pure being with no distinction between what is and its being. Article 11. God is he who is. The point of this summary is that the semantic framework Aquinas appeals to in order to articulate how words apply to God is not some ad hoc invention contrived to solve problems which arise independently of that framework. It is an extension and clarification of the framework within which the problems arise in the first place. Problems arise because of realist semantics, and Aquinas wants to use realist semantics to solve those problems. He's not going to like punt and invent something else, just special rules for God. Those with an alternative approach to language, a medieval nominalist, say, or a contemporary analytic philosopher of religion, not only would not solve the problem of divine naming in this way, they wouldn't share the problems themselves. So, for instance, nominalists had little use for any notion of analogy in theology or in any other context, having done away with the formal principle by which words signify things. And contemporary philosophers of religion often find no use for, indeed they typically find completely incoherent, the notion that in God the nature and the supposit are the same. If you tried to translate this or mistranslate it into contemporary analytic terminology, it sounds like you're calling God a property, right? Some of you have heard that objection. Why would you do that? But then, as this example shows, it is not only Aquinas' semantic questions about divine naming that would not arise from an alternative semantic framework, but the very metaphysical theses themselves which Aquinas wants to express within this semantic framework. For again, the problem of divine naming is the problem of how to extend our language, which is the language of composite rational beings making sense of a world of composite substances, to make true expressions about an absolutely incomposite being, a substance par excellence, subsisting being itself. How can we even conceive of God this way, and why would we believe there is such a thing? Within the conceptual framework implied by realist semantics, it necessarily follows from the existence of actual composite beings, which only have or participate in a share of being, that there is a first being, wholly actual, and so with no composition even of potency and actuality. That just necessarily follows within that framework. And it further necessarily follows that this purely subsistent being is wholly simple and fully perfect, since as fully actual, there is no way in which it could be any better than it already is. But within an alternative conceptual framework, again, I'll pick on nominalists and contemporary analytic philosophers of religion, for instance, none of these steps retains its internal logic. Why why must there be a first actuality just because there are some actual beings? 
How could God be an abstract entity like a nature or a property? How could the many divine attributes not be many properties of God? How could the notion of pure being be anything more than the most general, abstract, and conceptually empty notion? It turns out to be very difficult to translate the traditional metaphysical claims of Thomistic Aristotelian theology into an alternative semantic framework, one that does not analyze truth, signification, and predication in terms of actualities or forms. Thus, contemporary philosophical literature on Thomistic metaphysics and natural theology is full of claims that it is incoherent. I mean, Anthony Kenny is maybe the most famous for this, but lots of really, really smart people just say, that makes no sense. Even thinkers quite sympathetic to Aquinas, attempting to articulate and defend his views, find it challenging and end up expressing them in ways counter to his own logic. Um, just to pick one example, in, in the Rude Tevelde book, which is an excellent, excellent book, um, you get the impression for part of the book that Rude Tevelde believes that the uh, Aquinas' teachings on divine perfection are meant as a corrective to the teaching on divine simplicity. Um, that makes it sound as if it's something like external that has to be added on, but it, it follows directly from divine simplicity that God is perfect in Aquinas' logic. It's not a corrective. It's, it's a further explanation of what it means that God is fully actual. So, um, but I, I, I think that it just it illustrates how even someone who wants, is trying really, really hard to be uh, uh, sort of sympathetic to Aquinas' conceptual framework can still find it hard to enter into that way of thinking and, and um, treats the, the teaching on perfection as a sort of different metaphysical step. If we cannot think within the, realistic, the realist's conceptual framework, we will not only fail to follow particular arguments or misunderstand particular theses, but we will miss what Timothy McDermott has called the seminal idea that unifies and animates the material of the Summa, and we could say of all of Aquinas, from start to last. McDermott was criticizing another analytic study of Aquinas, and he explained in criticizing it, that seminal idea has as its base the understanding of the onward flowing existence of the temporal universe as owned and selved and circulated in various modes by agent substances. At its middle, it has that mode of substance that we call human being, a prudence which not only occupies existence, but is alive to existence in the way animals not only occupy space, but are alive to it, taking it in with intelligence and giving it out with loving care. And at its top, it has that creative providence of which human prudence is to be an instrument and in which the circle operates in reverse creation starting with the giving out and ending with the taking in. This is the seminal idea which orders the Summa, actuality as doing and being displayed in various modes and which generates the multiplicity of theses with which any student of Aquinas is initially faced. That's the end of the quote from Timothy McDermott. This seminal idea, McDermott says, if once taught, caught, could properly be called the voice of Aquinas. This seminal idea is not about linguistic analogy or divine naming. It's more fundamental than that. To invoke it, Thomists are used to invoking the analogy of being, say, as well as such ideas as participation, actuality, formal or exemplar causality, and many other concepts. What I have been arguing is that outside the framework of realist semantics, such ideas will remain empty mantras. What is needed is no more and no less than a thorough articulation of how Aquinas talked about being, how he understood the signification of the term being, which is a surprisingly demanding task. So to conclude, analogy for Aquinas is not one topic but two, which can be related but can, cannot be understood in relation unless they are first distinguished, the one a metaphysical concept, the other a linguistic one. The topic of divine naming for Aquinas is not synonymous with analogy in either of its senses, but we have seen that it fully displays the significant theological stakes and the complex semantic framework of Aquinas's seminal idea. Alternatives to the realist semantic framework may seem more appealing as more simple and straightforward, but ironically, they obscure key metaphysical claims, especially including the doctrine of divine simplicity not only what it means, but how it is derived from other metaphysical truths and what further theological truths follow from it. 
to make Aquinas' doctrine of divine names, the doctrine of divine simplicity, the relevance of associated meaning and proportional likeness, and the very signification of being, to make all of those things intelligible to those operating within a different conceptual framework is not a simple matter of translation. It is more a matter of helping those not versed in Aquinas' language to learn it for themselves. From any perspective, the stakes are the standard ones always at issue in philosophical conversation, whether we can achieve mutual understanding. But from a Thomistic perspective, the stakes are that much higher, whether we can even share a conception of the one true God and of ourselves as having received our being from him. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was uh, very comprehensive, and I'm going to be using this as a reference uh, in my work. Um, I just had a, a question about um, your division between social meaning and proportional likeness. Yeah. Two separate things. Um, and uh, this is more just a, a clarification of something that I'm a confused on. Uh, so the way that you've drawn it uh, makes it look like some a term will be either uh, used um, in a sense of associated meaning or in a sense of proportional likeness. Um, but would you say that a term can be used in both ways? Uh, so, so we have uh, something that's related in a form term schema, but as far as you might say, there's something which is... Uh, like the highest, right? God is the, God is the exemplar or, or the proper thing that we would have a reference of uh, prior and posterior. And so, and so the one reason why there's a lot of confusion is that sometimes the same term can have a lingu- linguistic associated meaning as well as be signifying a proportional likeness. So um, these are not different ways about how a term can be used. Um, the first one, associated meaning, is about how a term can it can be used in different ways. The second one is about how things can be related to each other. So it's not about terms, right? But then, so here here's what's not on the chart, but what can happen, and this, this is essentially what Kajetan does, and he thinks that Aquinas does it, and we can argue about that, but clearly Kajetan does it. Once we understand analogy as associated meaning, we can ask, okay, are there different ways that we can understand the relationships between the two meanings of the terms. Right? Sometimes it's a relationship of signifying cause or effect, right? So medicine and urine as, as related to the primary sense of health. But then other times, maybe the relationship of, of the meanings should be described in terms of this metaphysical category, proportional likeness. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you very much. That was really wonderful, and uh, I'm also going to be exploiting this hand up for a long time. Um, it, consider so it in the public domain. So Yeah, yeah so it, I guess just a couple of uh, thoughts. Maybe just um, for the sake of uh, background, uh, if you could say a little bit about, uh, you know, the developmental thesis that gets advanced by some right, commentators. And then as a follow-up, I want to pose a question. Um, you say that there are these two concepts of analogy and Aquinas, but they're clearly distinct from one another. But looking at the chart, looking at the evidence, I mean, you do have this set of texts where he's switching quickly back and forth between one and the other. Um, and looking especially at the De Principis Naturia text, um, I, I can grant that once you've drawn the distinction, um, you might see that he's using the notion of analogy in these two ways. Um, but at least a minimal developmental thesis still seems uh, to suggest itself that he works out the distinction between these two meanings of analogy because it does just come down to him as, as one term. Um, you know, so you could look to the Veritate 2.11 as a text where he, he actually works out uh, the distinction between the two in a clear way, you know, perhaps for the first time. Um, but in that context, he's answering the question about univocity and equivocation, and he uses proportional likeness in that text to try to answer that question. But it sounds like what you suggested is that the right answer to that sort of question um, is from associated meaning if you're talking about terms. Um, so I was just wondering if you could say a little bit about the, develop- the developmental theses uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and what you think about that minimal developmental thesis, Thomas working out the distinction. So specifically, um, the developmental thesis about Aquinas on analogy. 
So, so this comes from the fact that Aquinas many times asks a question like he does in Article 5 of Question 13, which is, um, how do terms signify God? Is it, is it unification or equivocation or something else? And that if you line up all the texts that he answers that question in, De Veritate does it in the sentences, he does it in the Casuma Contra Gentiles, he does it in Summa Theologiae, um, might even be a text like that in De Potentia, I don't remember. Um, yeah, that's what Mark Jordan's paper is about. Um, they they don't line up. They, he says something something different in each one. Um, and so one explanation for that is to say, oh, he kept changing his mind. Um, or to look for an overarching pattern, but even if you look for an overarching commonality, there's some outlier or other. Right? The most common developmental thesis says um, De Veritate is the is the most outlier, which is kind of a shame because it's the most detailed of all. Um, and um, then still has to reconcile why, how what he says, you know, before that is is consistent or not with what he says after that. And so um, Bernard Montaigne wrote a book, um, his his doctoral thesis, um, in which he he basically posits a grand metaphysical development in Aquinas, just to make sense of the differences between these two texts. I, I think that is a, a much more ambitious explanation than you need in order to make sense of the different texts. The, the, the texts superficially ask the same kind of question, right? Do we, do we speak univocally of God or some, some other way? But they, they each ask that question in a slightly different context and, and put different demands on the kind of answer that's given. So uh, the paper of my own that I reference in suggested reading gives an alternative view to the, to the developmental um, hypothesis. Um, why do I think that we should distinguish these two concepts in Aquinas and think that he always had them distinguished and didn't just sort of realize it later? Well, first of all, because they're clearly distinguished in Aristotle, and Aquinas saw that. And, and because it's not just that, that they happen to be related in some of these texts. I mean, one of the, some of these texts are very early, some are very late, where they are related. Um, but then he's also very careful in a lot of these other texts to, to be clearly talking about the one concept and not necessarily bringing in the other. Um, so I, I just think once you see that there's two concepts you, you, and, and you know that he would have gotten them from Aristotle where they were originally separate, um, you, you, you can recognize um, that Aristotle was aware of them, that he sometimes used the word analogy to describe one or the other or both, and then he sometimes used the concept without using that word because he was aware of this terminological confusion. So I don't know if that satisfies you, but that's the beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, I, I did have a question, though, and this is sort of to combine two different, two different sub-questions, but to sort of contrast um, the realist theory of semantics that I know you and Klima both both are, are uh, uh, much more well versed than I am in some of that, but I'm 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 not always clear. Um, maybe so. These are the two contrasts. The first is uh, what are the sort of similarities? It's so to my untrained ear, it sounds a lot like a subspecies of truth maker kind of ways of thinking about <coughs> predication. Um, so what what would be the differences between that and how would like the Thomistic kind of medieval theory handle things like negative truths, negative facts, uh, uh, Joe is not a, one, uh, a walrus or something like that. Um, and then on the other side, like how does that, uh, how does this interact with uh, uh, some of the Scotist uh, univocity concerns? Um, because I know you said Aquinas doesn't give any rationale. Uh, and there was a paper I read, I forget, in the ACPQ, I think, it was sort of like the, the Scotus concern about uh, shared meaning would could be accepted by or might even be integral to the way uh, Thomas' analogy should, should be constructed or something like that. So I don't know what your thoughts are on this. Um, what I understand about Truthmaker talk, um, which is not much, right, is not, not that... Um, you know, talk of form and realist semantics is a subset of that, but that it's it's almost an attempt to to revive that the role that forms would play. Um, and I don't know I don't know if it's fully adequate, but it does it does bring back this idea of of um, 
causal force that you need you need something that that isn't just correlating but is actually making something to happen that's what forms do they actualize so there's something active that that's the problem with trying to 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 describe it in terms of properties which seem sort of inert or they're just lying there or they sit on something but forms forms are actual and actualizing and they cause things to happen so i think that there are i, I think i think it's worth exploring whether um, a way to translate realist semantics into a contemporary context is through truth makers, and I'm, I'm kind of agnostic about whether it will be totally successful, but I think that's a, that's a worthwhile thing to do. Um, the, 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 the SCOTUS question is a really big one. Um, I've written about it elsewhere. Basically, SCOTUS, as, as far as I know, SCOTUS is the first one to define univocity in terms of the preservation of valid reasoning. Uh, might, that might sound like a surprise, but um, I, I can't find anybody before SCOTUS making that move. It's always been thought that in order to have valid reasoning, the terms have to have the same meaning, same in some sense at least, and so um, univocal words do preserve valid reasoning. Right? And if you have, you know, we all know one of the most common fallacies is the fallacy of equivocation, right? But Aristotle, Aquinas, all the commentary tradition on Aristotle's categories, Boethius, they all sort of accepted that there would be this special case of um, intentional equivocation that was close enough to univocation to preserve valid reasoning. Um, and Scotus is the first one to sort of like force the answer by saying, nope, can't do it. And then later Thomas, especially Dominicans, um, argue about how, how best to respond to SCOTUS. But that's that's a, protra a protracted debate. Can I, can I just follow up a little bit? I didn't hear so with the, a lot of your explanation of realist semantics is form in here in the subject. Yeah. So I, that's why I was curious about negative. Right. Cool. So you can deny that the form in here is in the subject, right? Socrates is not a, what did we say? I, I said something like John's not a wall. John's not a wall. So, so wall, 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 the substantial... There are no uniforms, like, Right. Right. In the world, there are no unicorns. Not everything that exists. So is nothing is being informed by the substantial form of a unicorn. No, 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 nothing's being actualized by that particular substantial form. I think we can go one more. They answer Okay. Yeah. I'll try to make the question short too. Um, I. Th I understood you to be saying that the way in which creatures are related to God is by the four-term four -term proportion thing. And I just would like you to sort of explain that a little bit more. I'm noticing here in this sentences passage at the, the bottom of the front page um, where he says there has to be some adequation. He's talking about similitude here. Either according to quality or according to proportion. I'm thinking if we had a picture of you the ratio of the height to the width would have to be the same. That's four terms. But the color of your jacket and the color of your jacket in the picture, there's no four terms there. They just match. But there might be if it's a manipulated picture. There might be some Yeah, but adequation. it might not. Fair enough. So I, so I take it that you can have similitude, or at least aspects of similitude, that don't involve four things. So I want to hear more about how, you know, Socrates' wisdom and divine wisdom, what are the four things? And since I know we're running out of time, I will say first, um, this this is a work in progress, and I'm happy to receive uh, comments on it. And I'm also happy to make the, the written paper available to people. Um, I, I mentioned a few times, but not as often as it actually happens. I argue with a lot of people in the footnotes, and I try to substantiate some things that I say um, in the footnotes. So I'm happy to share that if anybody's interested in the paper. Um, I mean, Aquinas... Is very clear that there can't be some some common thing that we both we share with God. God is so different from us that we can't be said to share something with Him. So, but we're like Him. Um, we represent Him. Um, that can't be by the inherence of a common form. But but we know even from these mundane cases like pictures and maps and statues that. Um, we can be, 
when when domains are different enough, right? So so the color of my jacket is a visual quality, and the image is going to have a visual quality. But um, when the domains are different enough, right, the, the 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 sameness of form becomes less and less important, but the reproduction of some some relationship can somehow remain. I mean, a great mundane example of proportionality is how we describe um, flavors. You know, that cheese is sharp. Well, it's not like literally pricking me the way a knife is sharp, but we don't ask, well, what do you mean sharp? Is there some same quality? No, like we all get it because we're, 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 our minds are sort of built to say, okay, I'm familiar with something over here. This is a totally different domain, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to import whatever I can and, and allow it to be changed through that importation process. We do that all the time. So um, there is something in, in God that is to him something like what is in Socrates that we call Socrates' wisdom. Now, it can't be exactly like that, first of all, because in Socrates, Socrates and his wisdom are not identical, and they are identical in God, but still, to understand what, what do I mean by God's wisdom, well, I mean whatever it is that's in God, and I know I'm using in in a different way, and, you know, that, that, that does for God what this quality of wisdom does for Socrates. So that's, I don't know if that's a good enough example. But, um, thank you. That's a great point on which to end this thing, Dr. Hershey.